This is Twit. All right, Steve, tell us about the Perseid Meteor Shower and why it's going to be special this year. Well, every year at this time, around August 12th, we have extra meteors appearing in the sky. And this particular event is called in the trade the Perseid Meteor Shower. And at its peak activity, you'll see maybe a meteor every minute or so if you have a dark location and can watch a lot of the sky. And you'll see it all, it's already all over the media and every website and every newspaper. It's, it's a very happy story to be able to put up there something that you know is going to happen. This year's special because first, the moon will be out of the way. The moon sets around midnight, so you won't have moonlight washing out meteors. And second, we've got two planets, Jupiter and Mars, appearing very close together in a sky that's a part of the sky that's already spectacularly filled with bright stars, the Taurus Orion region. So starting about three o'clock in the morning, the eastern sky is going to be just beautiful even before you get to the meteors. So um, peak activity is expected uh, late morning North American time on Monday. I would recommend this is more of a get up early thing than a stay up late thing. I would get up about three o'clock in the morning on Monday or three o'clock in the morning on Tuesday and and watch till dawn if you can. Uh, even if there are very few meteors, just for the two planets and all these bright stars, it's going to be a beautiful sky. So I've been calling this the second best sky event of 2024 after the eclipse because you have such such a nice combination of things going on. Mm. Well, it's definitely a very cheerful event. Without, you know, it's not a good use year for people to have something that's just happy to talk about, and nothing's quite so happy as having thousands of rocks hit the planet. But they're actually <laughs> they're not really all that big. All that I mean, we tend to think of like, especially with Shoemaker or Levy, that that thing was huge, uh, even like dinosaur huge. But how big is the typical meteor that, that we're going to be seeing on uh, on this upcoming weekend? The, the, the analysis indicates that most of the particles that make a meteor shower, like the regular meteor showers that recur at various times of year, these are little particles from comets, and they range from microscopic up to a few millimeters in size. And they are crumbly comet material. They're not pieces of solid rock or metal, except for one shower, a different one that may be caused by pieces of an asteroid, but that's a whole other topic. Um, so it's not actually rocks falling out of the sky. And if we have time for that, we can get into that because everybody in the planetarium business knows that that right after the Perseid meteor shower is a more than likely time to receive a phone call from somebody who has a strange rock and wants to know if it's a meteorite. Which, of course, if you're in the planetarium business, as we remember from Griffith, particularly being up on top of the hill, which all of Los Angeles can see. They call you with just about every weird question they could think of. My favorite of which, which I've related before, was, uh, hi, is this Griffith Observatory? Yes. Are you an astronomer? Yeah, sure. Uh, I found a frog on Hollywood Boulevard. What should I do with it? I thought, well, that, that is an intuitive leap for sure. Um, well, so, you know, my interpretation of that is at least they have enough respect for the institution to think you might know. At least you're a community resource, you know? Even if the question is not quite what you say you're in for, I would tell them I'm not a frog expert. But, but, but getting back to the meteorite question, um, um, I had the privilege of being the banquet speaker at a planetarium association convention a couple of years ago. And as a warm up at the beginning of the talk, this was about 75 people in the room, uh, many centuries of combined planetarium experience. And so I asked by a show of hands, how many people have had a call at your planetarium from somebody who has a rock and wants to know if it's a meteorite. Every hand went up. Second question, in how many cases was there even a slight chance that this actually was a meteorite based on what you heard or saw? One hand went up. So it's actually, <laughs> it's very, people find strange rocks and it's, I, we love curiosity and we love the institution being respected as a resource. But your chance of finding a real meteorite is very small. I'd say the last easily confirmable fall was that one that went hurtling through the ceiling of that people's house in, in yeah. Florida. That right. one probably, you know, you could safely say, okay, that's probably something from the sky. Although it turned out to be a piece of a space of the space station, didn't it? Was it? I think so. Um, so the uh, I remember as a young man trying to figure out why meteor showers were better after midnight. And it occurred to me, and I, I guess this is correct, that that's because the Earth has turned and is now facing 
the direction that the rocks live in space so they're they're hurtling in faster and i i suppose at a higher frequency and the way i always envisioned these things was in this case uh, the comet swift tuttle crosses the orbit of the earth along the um ecliptic the the equivalent of the solar system's equator and leave behind this kind of trail of gravel and that's what we're seeing every year is that the correct assessment Yes, uh, uh, the Earth plows through this trail of stuff, and and uh, we can get into it if you want. When you have time, if you have time, the way the astronomers in the early nineteenth century figured this out, um, um, just to get it started, uh, there was a German astronomer way back in the early eighteen hundreds who was thinking about meteors, and he said, you know, if meteors, if they're if these are made by particles from space. And if they're arranged at random in space, and they're flying around at random in space, but if we see them coming in from some preferred direction, that could be a physical clue that the Earth actually moves in space, as Galileo and Copernicus said it did. And at that time, the only other physical proof that the Earth moves was the so-called aberration of starlight, which had been measured, very difficult measurement, about 100 years before. And that's where... Uh, uh, light arrives at your telescope at a slight angle because of the Earth's motion through space, so stars appear very slightly displaced at different times of year. It's a really hard measurement. But um, up till then, there was no other physical proof that the Earth actually moved. It was just an idea that made a lot of sense. And this guy came up with this idea, maybe it would be a good idea to watch meteors statistically and see if there's any trend beyond just total randomness. And that could be a clue about how the solar system is organized and how things are moving. And, and, I, and then it goes on from there, and I can get into more of that in the next few minutes. But I think it's great because it's this low-tech observation. It doesn't involve super duper badass telescopes or high resolution clocks it involves a lot of people watching the sky and keeping records and then analyzing the records and you can get this profound insight about where we are in the universe and where we're going Nothing, long uh, answer to a short question <laughs> <laughs> when i was uh, running the observatory the small one we had at my university on friday evenings we'd have some very interesting and strange questions come up my favorite was can you point this thing at the sun right now and of course, it was about 10 o'clock at night, and the person said it with a completely straight face. But the other one that came up there was a little, <laughs> bit, a little bit less bad than we had. I like that question. <laughs> was we got a lot of times, it was how do I take photographs? And this was really early digital camera days. People started to get those little tiny early digital cameras. And it was very different to try to do long exposure times. For folks who are going to be watching this or might be setting a camera out at nighttime because they want to stay up for it, is there any kind of good method to go around you know, photographing videos? Any suggested advice for? How do we actually keep this, you know, in our memories? Um, the key is to be lucky, which means to take a whole lot of exposures. So um, there may be a way to do it with the software on your phone. Check around. I have an iPhone SE, so it's fairly simple. But I got great results from this 15 or 20-year-old Canon point-and-shoot S95. What I do is put it on a tripod. And then there's this, this software, hacker software you can download that enables you to get extra control of the camera. Set it with an intervalometer function. Intervalometer automatically takes pictures and over and over again until you tell it to stop. Set it to take 15-second exposures and just keep doing that until the memory card fills up or the battery dies or dawn comes and I stop it. And at the end, you'll have several hundred pictures and you go through them and some of them will have meteors. Um, so that's what has worked for me. It's basically whatever your equipment, whatever what you need to be watching a large part of the sky and have your shutter open as much of the time as possible because you never know when a meteor is going to come. So you take a lot of pictures and then look for the good ones. Kind of going back to the, the idea of these giant banks of gravel in space, the comets leave behind. How how long do I mean, those last for very long periods of time for us to go through? Or does that get refreshed by the comet a lot? What's that actually look like? Well, it, it it they get refreshed every time the comet goes near the sun. So we we have come to understand that a comet is a dirty snowball that it's frozen water and frozen carbon dioxide with a crust uh, or mixed in or with a crust of kind of dark carbon rich crumbly material. And these things spend most of their time way, 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 way far out in the solar system because they're on big elliptical orbits. And in a very elongated elliptical orbit, you spend most of your time far out. 
where it's very cold, very dark, we don't see them, but once in a while they come in near the sun, the sun heats up these ices, turns them to gases, so they blast through the dark crust, shoot jets of material, including dust, out into the trail of the comet, and then uh, the astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli first figured this out in the 1800s. If you have a blob of particles that whips around close to the sun by the calculus of Newton's laws of gravity, that blob of particles will spread out into a long stream along the orbit. So every time that stream goes around the sun, it will get longer and longer. And if this happens, if these, these episodes of pieces breaking off the comet, if those happen multiple times, you'll have multiple streams, and after a while, they will extend all the way around the orbit. So even though the comet may not be anywhere nearby, you may be cutting through one or more streams of material that it left behind. So interesting you mentioned Scaparelli, who, of course, is a little more nefariously known for uh, having made copious observations of Mars and labeling, probably quite innocently, the lines he saw, which may or may not have been the capillaries in his retinas reflected back in his eyepiece, canali, which of course many, including Percival Lowell, translated into English as canals, implying artificial creation and so forth. So we love Scaparelli for that. Hey, if you enjoyed this clip, be sure to check out This Week in Space. You can find us on your favorite podcast app or see the link in the description below. See you there. <laughs>